Thanks for uh, being here this afternoon, and uh, we're teed up for a development afternoon with Zeke right after us. This is going to be, I think, a really good, rounded conversation. We got some of the best minds in what I call cutting edge development. I think we all do a lot of very interesting development together, but the people up on the stage with me today, I, I visited their communities and talked at length with them. They're my mentor, they're my board of counselors and everything I do at Silverado and trying to improve our communities and products. So I just wanted to throw out some interesting questions and you guys are welcome to go anywhere with them um, based on what I know about what you're doing. And starting with Randy, you know, Randy has been my mentor for many years now and, and kind of teaching me the way of hospitality, melding with senior housing and, and seeing his Scottsdale community and his community here in Palo Alto. V has really taken, um, I, I wouldn't even call it senior living, just living to a whole new level of um, really just beautiful high-end hospitality. And Randy, if you could just talk a little bit about that beyond just the ambiance the service and, and really where you're going from here. If you could share that with us to start, that'd be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, the recession, of course, tripped us up. We, we did a, a, a lot of development in the first decade of, of this millennium and more or less doubled the size of the company. And they're some of our best programs because we took what we learned uh, from uh, previous development and, you know, some problem children that we acquired along the way and uh, so I think some of the latest uh, developments that we did um, you know, are, are the best work that we've done. We're trying to get back into the game. It's been very tough. Um, as you know, there's a lot of money out there, but uh, people chasing real estate from all different food groups. And so it's very competitive. And all of a sudden, the real estate is you know, back to, in many markets, pre-recession price levels. Uh, so that makes it a little bit challenging. but. Um, the new programs that we have, I think the best illustration uh, today is we did a, we're just concluding a $90 million renovation in uh, Naples, Florida at our Bentley Village community, which is over 30 years old. And so it, it's clearly time for reinvestment. It's been very successful, great location. Two new clubhouses and, you know, the focus is really on lifestyle and the amenities that you include in, in uh, the lifestyle package. So in that community, we have you know, 18 holes of golf, two swimming pools, uh, you know, fitness center. If you go to the, the, the clubhouse, it's more uh, lifestyle or activity focused. You'll find a, a juice bar, much like a resort um, uh, and food service bistro. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of emphasis on the amenity spaces, which of course are not income producing. So you've, you've got to, um, you know, you've got to be able to sell against that. Uh, to make sense of it. Uh, with, with that uh, redevelopment, we're adding some new congregate units, which is a product type that we don't have in the community today. Um, and uh, they're, they're averaging a million dollars in that entry fee. So it's been very, very well received by the, by the uh, customer in the marketplace. Um, and you know, the, the thing I can, the thing that it strikes me today, if you, I don't care if you have an assisted living building or you know, a big CCRC like what we're talking about, the, the space is very important to people. And it's almost the price of entry today. Uh, there's a lot of tired product out there and, you know, um, people are gonna make choices and go to places where they, they see you've really put some thought into the design and to uh, the quality and finish in the amenity spaces. That gets you in the door. Then you have to deliver. So I, I, can, I see, you know, going forward in the future, the focus on, on uh, operation quality um, and, and high quality service and care is just going to be in, in increasingly important as we go forward. And we all know uh, in, in this stage of, of uh, development in our industry right now, the operator is becoming much more important in the equation. So high quality operators are gonna be in high demand. Thanks, Randy. And uh, along the same lines, you know, Steve Moran just the other day came up with a really interesting proposition at another conference around absorption. And I think, I think Randy has somewhat of an affinity and, and a, a niche within seniors that he fills and is drawing a broader kind of base from. 
Arun, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I met you six, seven years ago at a NIC conference where you won the award to start your company, I think, as, as a kind of uh, startup grant that they were giving at NIC against Ryan Frederick, and fortunately he opened up too. But uh, you've really tapped into an affinity market that, uh, you know, in Steve's view of the world, opens what's typically our absorption for an industry at around 8% of the overall market to more like 15 to 20% because we're including these new niches and new cultures and new, just different people that want our product and the way that we're serving them. Could you talk a little bit about that, how you've re-engineered what has been kind of just the, the plain old assisted living? Sure, yeah. Um, well, we, we definitely feel that Affinity is a very powerful model. Um, you know, people uh, want to uh, feel connected uh, with um, their neighbors. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we think that conventional product doesn't always address the, uh, the needs of, of, of groups within our society. So, uh, you know, for us, what that means is our, our focus is on the Indian uh, demographic within the U.S. Um, so we uh, deliver customized programming. Um, you know, we have a very good yoga program, meditation classes, Ayurvedic lifestyle workshops, uh, Bollywood dance classes, uh, Indian food. Um, and, uh, and we found that to be very effective in serving, in serving this group. Um, um, as far as penetration rates, you know, I I think Steve's probably uh, got a better sense of that as to as to uh, you know where we can go with it. I mean, I to be honest, uh, uh, but but yes, I mean, I, I certainly we feel that penetration rates can be higher um, than they have been uh, because uh, these groups today are not being served by uh, the product that's out there. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Some of the programming you just mentioned, we thought at Silverado is revolutionary with cognitive enhancement, enhancement, yoga, meditation, all those things we're starting to re-engineer as a way to improve cognition and we're, we're proving it out. And that's just a day-to-day -day program that you do. So it's really ingrained in what you're naturally doing within in the affinity uh, product type you created. So that's just fantastic. Um, Jeremy, along those lines of, of kind of doing something different, we've talked about technology for the past, you know, uh, half day and even all last night, your your thrive and what you do is is kind of combining a little bit of what Randy does on the high end and really beautiful communities. And by the way, this is a rolling screenshot of all the different communities of the people represented up here today. You can see it's just phenomenal um, ambiance and, and, and product that's being offered. How are you accentuating that beautiful design with technology and what are some of the things that you're doing to differentiate yourself? Yeah. I appreciate that. We, I didn't get my act together in time to send pictures in. So the ones that say Avanti on them, I think those are, I think those are actually. <laughs> uh, but you gave her all the good ideas. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. yeah, he definitely gave them all to me. So um, I cringe a little bit about, um, I think a few years ago, the, the environment was very different. But I cringe a little bit about being uh, so closely tied as a technology innovator uh, in the industry. And one of the, one of the reasons is, uh, pretty much everybody's doing a, a lot of the core things that we do. So having an electronic health record, a, a medication record platform, um, uh, access control, a lot of those things are, are becoming more universal. So it's, it's less and less of a differentiator. Uh, but I think the core reason why we do those things, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I think the, the core reason why we do those things is to enhance the experience for the residents, the caregivers, the staff in the building. Um, and we continue to try to run all of these new things that we try through that filter. Um, and I think we've learned some really valuable lessons and frankly more the hard way than the easy way over the past couple of years. Um, I think one of those is um, being less tied to specific vendors, at least publicly. I think early on we were so excited about some of the programs that we had and were championing that um, some of our early collateral looked like a NASCAR, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> sponsored NASCAR car. Uh, with stickers all over it. And the, the, the issue with that is when we were excited, we wanted to promote our partners in this, but uh, the issue with that is if that, if that trial, if that pilot, if that program doesn't work, you're sort of tied to that, right? So uh, I think we've learned a very valuable lesson there in that. But the, the core uh, reason behind some of these things that we've tried, some of the things that haven't worked, some that have worked very well, is still to enhance that experience for them. So um, view it as a tool, uh, as a means to an end, not an end in itself. 
And uh, I think in our, our position on that has evolved. I really think we, when we started using some of those tools, we viewed them just quite honestly as more of a marketing tool and more of uh, something that we would do to attract attention and be different. Uh, and now that it's no longer a clear differentiator in the market, I think you can be more honest, or we can at least be more, a little more honest about it and say, look, we're not doing this uh, to put on a brochure. We're doing this because we really think it enhances the experience. And I think that's changed the way that we've looked at, at how we're using technology in the building. That's awesome. And it's interesting. Um, one of our founders, Steve Winter at Silverado, kind of always discouraged me from talking about technology because he believed people being people-centered and what we do really makes the difference. And, and I always beg to differ, as you are, that, that technology can enhance what we're doing beyond just the marketing ability. He was always afraid of the marketing and the fact that it does replace people for the vendors in the room that's not always a good thing. Um, you, you know, a robot does not give a great hug. I'm sorry, just yet, it does not. Um, what's your advice in the room, Jeremy, for the vendors and people that are here to go beyond a pilot? I think I talked to three or four people this morning, all of us have, that, hey, we really like what they're offering. Can we try it out? How do you get, as a vendor, beyond just a pilot? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that question, because, or, or maybe we are, because we've fallen on our face a few times trying it. but. Um, we took some products beyond a pilot and we tried some pilots in uh, environments in, and at times when we shouldn't have done it. Uh, so we tried pilots in brand new buildings that we were just opening. Uh, we tried to roll out our electronic health record platform in a brand new building that was just opening and had a massive amount of move-ins. That was a terrible idea uh, in hindsight and it wasn't a fair trial of the product, the vendor, our people. It just, it, uh, and thankfully we, we, we were able to give it a fair shot later but the um, the environment we tried that in, I think we learned a, a very, very valuable lesson there. So I, if there's one nugget of advice in that, it's be careful when and where you try something new. Make sure there's enough support, not only on your associate staff, but the vendor staff to get it done. That's, I, right. that's where I've fallen down, is I just don't have enough people. I'm excited by it, but there's nobody at home willing to pick up and do this uh, you know, computer automated maintenance program that I came up with. You know, that just didn't work out. You know, and uh, getting that support, I think, and baking that into that pilot is definitely key. So thank you for that. Um, Lori, along those same lines, I, you know, I want to go a little bit into the psychology of what you're building and why you're building it. But I know, you know both you and Jeremy are very passionate about technology. Do you have a different take or similar take what, what did you teach Jeremy about technology? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, very similar to Jeremy, you know, technology doesn't replace the human touch, as you pointed out. Robots um, can't give a warm and fuzzy hug. Um, the other thing, though, that we use um, the technology um, portion for is also just to connect um, and collaborate with healthcare providers so that interoperability interoper function through the healthcare records and creating your own exchanges um, so that the medical profession can have real-time data um, to make better diagnosis, which then in turn help them with readmission rates and all of that fun stuff. So, um, you know, we, we kind of use it as connections to the families. Uh, we use it for data, um, for streamlining things, for operational efficiencies. But we also, um, you know, are, are definitely moving more towards um, utilizing the data that we have to share with the healthcare providers. And are you finding, you know, listening to Dan earlier and some of the things that Dan Hudson has shared with me, following the resident from the day they call you all the way through to, you know, the, the day they pass and having all that information, all those touch points, whether it's through CRM or whatever programs you use, how are you using technology in the front end and designing your building? You know, we talked a lot about the buyers and the buyer psychology that you're appealing to. Can you talk a little bit about that with the Avanti? design and, and how are you using technology and the data you have to market to those people? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a big question. Um, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that we do, you know, just like everyone else, you try it, you don't know if it's going to work. Interesting enough, um, when we had a focus group, when we opened the first building a few months later, we brought in all the families and said, you know, out of all the technology, what would, you know, what do you want? What do you want to keep? Because our building is filled with it. And so, you know, if you had to, if we had a very limited budget, we had to, you know, cut out certain things, what are the things that you would keep? All of them, hands down, um, said the, you know, point of care device that connects, you know, into the hospital system so they can have that data. Oddly enough, they never see it. It was just the families loved 
the peace of mind knowing that healthcare, to, you know, doctor to doctor, that information could be shared. Um, and then um, the other biggest thing that um, the families just loved, and it's something we're about to launch, so all they've heard about was the marketing material, because they haven't experienced it yet, was just kind of tracking of healthcare stats, whether it's, you know, how long they're in the shower, how many, you know, steps are they taking every day, how many bites, you know, are they eating through this tracking device that we've been working with um, a company with. And um, they, again, not experienced it, but they were like hands down, they wanted that. So interesting enough, out of all the technology stuff, they like knowing the data that we're collecting can be utilized to, again, help maybe be proactive with care, again, you know, we're, um, healthcare, we tend to be not just in our own sector, but just healthcare in general is more reactive. And so they like the fact of being proactive. Yeah. And so that's that's been a big eye opener for us. No, that's awesome. And that's a lot of what Chip, I think, was saying last night, mm -hmm. too, is how to get ahead of the ball and invite mm -hmm. them along. With your psychology and with, you know, the one of the thousands of slides we saw flash by us earlier that stuck with me last year and still with me today is the daughter and the daughter-in-law are really the decision makers in our, you know, I had to see it to believe it and, and it, it all proves out. Jeremy taught me last night that 70% of the buying power are really from women in the market out there buying all kinds of things, not just senior housing. Um, how are you building your building? What, what are you doing about your design to really market to that? demographic of, of the daughter-in-law and the daughter. Yeah, so um, you guys all saw the slide earlier today. You know, the, the, it's, the, it's the daughter or the daughter-in-law, and then it becomes the son. So in our, you know, we all know that um, it's the female that makes the decision in our space. And so um, when we were designing the building, we really took that to heart. So, you know, who we sell to, the adult daughter, who we serve, the resident, who we employ, majority of them are female. So our building um, looks, feels, acts, touches very much like a female. And um, one of our mantras is we're just putting sexy into senior housing. And we're really proud of it because what female doesn't want to feel sexy and look sexy, you know? And um, so we have everything from the design, you know, the, the walls, the floors, you know, blown glass, I mean, you name it, it has a feminine touch to it. Um, but more importantly, not just to the design, architecturally as well as interior, also the programming. You know, we have a mind-body strength program. Um, we worked and we have a bar, a senior bar class, like Pure Bar for all you ladies out there. You know, we have senior yoga. Um, we actually have a nail bar. Um, you know, we just do things that when that adult daughter walks in, it's things that she's experienced on the outside of the doors and perhaps can correlate to them and say, wow, I wanna do that with my mom at Avanti and um, just giving them that experience. So instead of taking mom outside to go and have her hair done, you know, or go get a massage, she can come into our spa that is just like a real spa because they don't, they actually had to start training the salon folks on how to do perms because they didn't know how. Um, we had a couple <laughs> of seniors that still wanted them. So, um, um, but you know, our staff um, goes to the workout sessions, our, our team, they go to the, the spa themselves. Um, and so that's really what we tried to do is make it to where it doesn't matter what age you are, it's just going to be things that, that the women want to experience and connect with and can inspire them and, and make them feel appreciated. Oh, that's awesome. The blown glass always caught me. I'm looking at you. It's a, <laughs> just a touch, incredible touch. Um, and I think, I think learning more about just market specific mm -hmm. design too that we were talking about mm -hmm. last night, um, wherever you are designing to that. Uh, psychographic is, is incredibly important and to that bill um, you've taught me obviously you know the importance of site and siting and market analysis and you know maybe some of those markets that we all thought were great aren't and and there's really you got to go in for the um, rock ridge let's call it opportunities or the banker hills opportunities can you talk a little bit about you know where your product sets going um, where your communities are going in that regard. Where, where do you see the future of Merrill um, now that you've crossed all the barrier to entry markets uh, and going into China now? Um, where, where do you go from here and, and kind of what's your thinking today um, on that journey? Yeah, when we, uh, Merrill Garden started developing 24 years ago in senior housing and, uh, you know, the, we had a very productive 
portfolio that we built over time. Uh, and we got to a point where we sat back and we looked at it and we realized that every place we had, we were busing our seniors someplace. And, uh, and so we did a fund not too long ago, actually I guess it was 2007, and um, instead we went and we changed our thought pattern as to what we were gonna do. Uh, Merrill Gardens is a, is a for rent uh, uh, senior housing provider. Uh, we don't do entrance fees. We hit kind of the mid market to upper middle market of seniors and we do independent assisted and memory care. Uh, typical building size is 120 to 150 units. So we're not big and um, as a building footprint. But what we, what we did when we went back in 2007 was we started to say, okay, as we look at our portfolio, all of our seniors are on the outside. Why don't we go and find sites on the inside and keep the seniors connected with the, with the communities? And so we started a process which has been for us very successful. Uh, it's a form of intergenerational housing because what we do is we look for sites in community centers. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a small town or whether it's a city like Seattle or, or, uh, or San Francisco or Los Angeles. What we're really looking for are sites where seniors can walk outside their door and be part of that intergenerational experience they grew up with. And, uh, and we took that um, even one step farther when we assembled a whole block and we put senior housing together with multifamily together with retail together with uh, actually a portion of it was student housing and it was an experiment at the start but wow has that been successful opened in 2009 and it's never been less than 98 99 percent occupied and uh, and what's really interesting is what happens when you put those dynamics together you know, uh, Randy and V do some fantastic um, CCRCs. We don't build buildings that big, but what we were looking for was a way to keep seniors connected. We, we have one project right now uh, that we're doing down in Southern California. It's taken us four years to get the village to agree to allow senior housing in the heart of the village. And yet that project is one of the ones I'm most excited about because it's adjacent to the library, it's adjacent to, the, to all of the shopping in the village. Seniors can walk out their door, and keep in mind, the we, majority of our seniors are independent, but they can walk out that door and they are there with the families. Um, there's a farmer's market that happens you know, every week right in front of it. Those seniors will stay connected, and that's one of the things that, that, we, uh, that we pitched was, um, we were looking for that unique site and we sat down with the city council and we helped them understand you have two choices. You can keep your, sen your seniors in the community or you can push them away. And so in, in our case, that's mostly where we're focused. We realize it's a niche. Not everybody can, can build in these community centers, but, uh, but we think it's, a, it's going to appeal for a very long period of time to seniors uh, and they'll want to be there because they're connected. And um, if you haven't been to Merrill University mm -hmm. District there, it, it's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen around the country. It's in Seattle, it's right next to UW. Uh, what Bill didn't mention is next to one of the highest end outdoor mm -hmm. malls that you could walk to from this community. Mm -hmm. There's a liquor store, a pharmacy, five-star Italian, all wrapping the podium. And you have students playing flag football with the seniors in the center courtyard. I mean. That's where I want to live when I'm right now. You know, uh, it's it's uh, it's just a really kind of amazing place. And, and Bill, you've assembled what, all the things that that we all want. I think you know whether it's later in life or today to really live. And, and so I commend you for that. It's just incredible. Um, wanted to to also touch on a topic that I think is real important to obviously all of us. This is a development panel, but without as you've heard all day, without the operators, without the people in the buildings, we're really just a shell. We, do, we can't do the magic we do. And, and Bill and I and Randy and, and really everybody on the panel have spent a, a tremendous amount of time thinking about workforce development. And I wanted to just spend a second getting each of your takes on, on kind of how 
you know, Argentum is saying we're going to need a million two additional workers in the next 10 to 20 years to kind of meet this gray wave that's coming. Um, I want to hear from you kind of what you're doing differently. Um, you know, one thought I just <coughs> caught Greg Stapley from Care Trust Reed. He shared with me when they started Ensign Group, he took no salary but was paying interns $30,000, $40,000, you know, at a loss to their company to have this young talent that's now their leadership. And I thought that was amazing as a, as a workforce development tool. Um, what are some of the things, um, Lori, I'll just go down the line, and, and I know Bill, Bill's very involved with this and can speak to it. Um, what are some of the things you're doing to attract millennials or just new people to, we can't develop without more workers. So, so how are we gonna attract those workers? Um, well, we all know, I mean, people first. I mean, that's the name of the game, right? Um, there's, it's period, it's just period right there. Um, we actually, because the majority of our workforce are females, we, we just really utilize that um, with having a female leadership team. Um, it, and it plays very nicely because it allows um, from an ED to a housekeeper, they can relate and say, wow, that leadership team, they have a family, they have kids, she understands what we're going through. Um, and we really breathe that into our organization from the top down. And um, while I, I know everybody does that, it's just a lot easier um, when the folks at the top are female because they know that they personally have experienced that themselves. So we, we talk a lot about that very openly. We talk a lot about just growing women in the workforce and we talk very um, passionately about the struggles that you go through in life balances and um, we coach each other. Um, I'm not just a coach, I ask tons of questions myself and it's not just to my leadership team, I walk in a building and I'm asking you know, an ED who might have a 15 year old daughter my daughter's 10 going through some hormone changes, what the heck do I do, you know? <laughs> and so um, it's really breeded its own, it's, it's, it's breeded its own monster. It's really kind of nice. Uh, we do that, but that's just a part of it. We do a lot of other things, um, just kind of putting sexy into how they look and feel and come to work. Um, we take great pride in, you know, having them dress for success. We talk about that and we, we give them the tools to do that. So. Our Avanti swag is not polo shirts and khaki pants, and it's not scrubs either. You know, it's very boutique style. Everyone's in all black and branded, and um, suits for the executive director and management team. And it's um, it's been kind of interesting because we'll have you know family members that come from a competitor down the street. They've moved in with us, and they'll say, "Where do you get your staff from?" And I think in my head that this from the place you just came from, actually. <laughs> but it's they have a pep in their step. They just, they like working there. They feel good, they look good. They have a beautiful building to work in. Um, they dress for success. And then I think just the culture that we work really hard. Um, you know, it's hip, it's fun. We have a Google-like team lounge. Um, it's got, you know, every building is different. Um, we have from a ping pong table to air hockey to dart boards, um, charging stations. Um, we have a restaurant in our building, and everyone gets a you know gets a meal on their shift that's not deducted from their paycheck. Um, to just you know everyone experiences the spa when they start. It's part of our onboarding program. Um, you know folks that make you know 10, 12 bucks an hour that's a luxury to them, um, and so for them to experience that makes them feel good. All the way to um, you know, just kind of loving on them, I guess, and understanding and, and knowing who they are. And so I don't think we have any secret sauce. We're trying to figure it out just like everybody else, but sometimes it doesn't come down to who pays the most. It just depends upon how they're, how they're treated. Yeah. And we found that that just worked really, really well. And then just having a fun, hip, cool company. That's sexy. Yeah, joining the Avanti family. I yeah. like it, I like it. <laughs> Bill, um, I've thrown a thousand things at you on workforce development, we're trying to create a, a framework on what we should and shouldn't do. Joel Mendez here has a phenomenal idea how to get to high school um, guidance counselors with a videotape and we're, we're all trying to figure out how to get that Got Milk campaign out to uh, millennials to get into the business of seniors, uh, you know, Got Seniors. So what are, what are the two or three things we need to focus on, Bill? You, you've been able to focus me, which is amazing. Um, because I'm totally unfocused, but uh, you know, what, what are the two or three things you think we need to do to really sure. move the needle? I, I think from my perspective, there are a couple. One, um, uh, we several, uh, several, several of us in Puget Sound went together uh, 
with the Washington State University and created a senior housing program, senior housing administration, administration program in the hospitality school at Washington State. And I came away from that experience recognizing that 98% uh, of those juniors and seniors walking into uh, my class at Washington State University, their entire outlook, if they thought about senior housing at all, was nothing more than end of life care and they didn't want any part of it. They were young, they didn't want to think about end of life, and they didn't realize how diverse senior housing really is. And about 15% of those then, after that course, in each of the five years, winds up shifting from hotel to senior housing. You know, I, I love the idea of reaching out with a toolkit to guidance counselors in high schools and community colleges and four-year universities and waking that whole workforce up to the opportunities that exist in senior housing. But that's step one. Step two, and actually step 1A, is we have to be prepared to accept those and to give those, those students coming in, those young professionals who are gonna try this as an industry, uh, the tools and the skills for success. And uh, so many of what we find right now, I've made the comment to some of my colleagues that I'm getting a little uncomfortable because I'm finding us in our company starting to reach to promote people because of the staffing pressures that we haven't trained and, and properly equipped to manage uh, a very complex business from that standpoint. And so we've invested heavily in step two in a learning management system which will allow us to track everybody in our team from, uh, from a wait staff to a caregiver to, uh, to an executive director uh, with what they've been trained on, when they've been trained, what the results of the training were, and what they're gonna be trained on next to help them achieve their goals. Because I believe when someone comes into our company, we have an obligation and an opportunity to help them understand what their career paths are and that we're gonna invest in them to, uh, to be successful. And the third thing that I have apart from that uh, in order to really grow this industry uh, and be successful is really to reach out and start partnering where we can where we can get quality training material already in place at universities and bring it in an online environment into smaller companies uh, because we're not all Brookdale. Um, where we can have quality training material that we can then work with a, with a forward thinking organization like Argenum to get credentialing in place so that like other industries, we can have a credentialed uh, executive director position, which means something, and everybody knows what it means, or a credentialed assisted living supervisor position who, who has achieved a certain level of training professionalism that has been recognized. And that can't all be homegrown, I mean, to be successful. So I think those three things, to reach out and, and wake up the, the young younger generation as to what a great career opportunity this is to have programs in place in our, in our companies that can give these young people career paths that they can understand and that we're going to invest in. And then number three, to do a great job of marshalling the material that's already out there that we can bring to improve uh, their professional credentials. Fantastic. Fantastic. So there's a huge, obviously, initiative underway and need everybody's help in this room to kind of make this happen, this workforce development. Because without, if we're all just hiring the same people within our industry, we're, we're just not gonna get there, obviously. So, um, thanks for that. Arun, on, on your new affinity and, and program, how are you encouraging people that might be a little afraid or tentative that, that are expecting maybe the normal senior housing within the industry or without the industry, how are, how are you enticing people to come to work for you? Yeah, well it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, the, the affinity model, it's, uh, for us, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because uh, um, it means we have a smaller pool of, of folks that, um, that we can hire from. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't, we don't restrict our hiring uh, based on uh, ethnicity, but, you know, certainly cultural awareness, language skills, those things are important. Um, 
but you know, the flip side of that is, is we, I think we've been able to uh, really uh, create a sense of mission in, in what we're doing and, um, um, and really appeal to folks at that level, which is that, you know, what, and, and I think that's true of, of the whole industry is, you know, we're, we're serving a very important function in, in society. And, um, you know, I think that, that sense of mission is, is, what we, um, is what we focus on. Fantastic. Yeah. And Chip had said it last night, the calling, mm -hmm. as I said, uh, Brookdale and, and I know uh, Silverado and, and all the companies here have spent a lot of money trying to figure out, hey, what is the one secret sauce item that everybody needs to have to be a leader in this business? The one thing I think we've all come up with is exactly that, that, that people have uh, found a challenge earlier in life and have a mission in what they're doing. And that challenge might have been the military, it might have been taking care of grandma, it might have been putting themselves through college, but, but challenged earlier in life to kind of bootstrap themselves some way, somehow, and really having that kind of mission-based or servant-based leadership quality. That's all we could find so far. So those are the people we're rounding up as quickly as we can to bring them in and uh, hopefully entice them to work with us. Um, Jeremy, your, your thoughts on uh, you kind of a wider geogra geographic kind of footprint that you're working with mm -hmm. and, and constantly growing. How are you staying ahead of the workforce challenges that are out there. Yeah, I think a few things, and you, you touched on it, but um, we're, I think there's a huge opportunity with millennials to, um, I think we have sort of a secret weapon as an industry is that, and you can see there's a ton of research that points to this, and Chip alluded to it last night, that millennials are, are much more motivated by a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of true vision um, than they are necessarily material things. So they're not as, quite as coin operated as some of the other generations have been. And um, uh, I think we can, we can leverage off of that as an industry. We, there's an altruistic nature to what we do. There's a true purpose behind it, something you can be proud of when you go home at the end of the day. Um, and I think we're doing a really terrible job, myself included, of communicating that uh, in the market as we go to recruit. So putting a, a job posting on ADP or Monster or wherever it is we're going to recruit caregivers from, um, I, I think we're, we're still gonna end up recycling each other's CNAs. Uh, you know, for the next 20 years, we don't break out of that mold. So I think some of these uh, programs to partner, the education program, we've, we've made a ton of hires recently uh, at a management level out of the uh, George Mason program. We've got some new communities in the Mid-Atlantic and that is absolutely a phenomenal uh, program, a phenomenal thing to do and that's the way that they're attracting this millennial generation to, to go into that program at George Mason is through this altruistic kind of vision, purpose-driven uh, sense behind it. So. I think that training program as well, we had a dismal excuse for a training program until really just a few months ago. And um, uh, we, we've stolen some material from other businesses that we respect a lot and, and put in. There's other people that have done a lot of very similar things before and uh, as complex as what we do is, it's also not brain surgery. And there's elements of hospitality, there's elements of the food service business, there's elements of a lot of different things in our business that I think we can learn from others that have done it well. Fantastic. So. And, and without Randy, I would have not ever been nominated or elected to the Future Leaders Council at NIC, which he helped start. Uh, I'm pretty sure he just gave me a pass and waved me in because uh, he knew me. So that was fortunate for me. Um, that was one just incredible initiative that's impacted me personally and a lot of people I know. Randy, um, as you were chair of NIC, and, and I know you're very passionate about this, what other types of broader initiatives are you looking at to draw more people into the business. Yeah, so the, you know, just to, it, it's, it's hard to expand much upon what's being said here because it's all right on point. Um, we do need, we need, you know, plain and simple more people in, in the industry going forward. I mean, the, the demand on professional caregivers just in one segment of our, you know, of our business is going to be incredible uh, going forward. And it's a challenge I'm not sure we've totally figured out. It's an initiative that an Argentum has taken on though, and so I think there'll be some, some good things to look forward to from, from that and getting some of the bright minds together to really figure out how, how we do that. Certainly tapping into the education system is a big part of that. I, like Bill, have done a lot of work, and you have with Lauren and I have done the, our classes at UCLA, for example, and you, you go into um, have a, a session with these students with, you know, 60 or 70 students, and you find out how many don't even really know about the industry and they, and they said wow this is really pretty cool you know so there's some kind of bootstrap and suspenders work that needs to happen you know in that category 
Um, but in addition to that, here's what we found. Uh, several years ago, I got really tired of trying to go out and find an executive director every time I lost one you know, from the industry. So we developed you know, a, a, a management development program in-house to do that so we could recruit and place people from within. In addition to that, one of the things we really started focusing on was turnover. So today we operate at, this past year we have 23% uh, turnover. Um, I don't know if you guys measure that, but I would encourage you to do, to, to do so. It's a really important, to me, an op a very important operating metric. Why? I want to keep the people, the good people that I have. I want to keep them stuck, you know, to, to the company. So the other, the part of that, that that we really focused on is that has really helped us is reinvesting in your employees, training programs, as everyone has mentioned. Uh, we have, you know, we have uh, a master's program reimbursement for people. We encourage them to, you know, go to school, and we help them get an education. Uh, we have, uh, you know, endowment funds that are created on out with with our help, but also the residents that go to. Uh, uh, scholarships for the children of people that work in our communities has been very, very successful. Um, but when people see that you reinvest, that you're investing in them, it's meaningful and it becomes part of the culture and it's more than a paycheck. Yes, you have to pay well and you have to be competitive and you have to have good benefits and you know all of those things we know. But to keep the, the good people in your system, once you have them and you spent you know, that kind of energy and time developing, you know, that, that uh, standard of workforce is really important. We can't develop, or excuse me, we can't deliver high quality and care, high quality care and service every single day if we have 50% turnover in our workforce. It just is impossible to do because you're chasing it all the time. So the focus for us has not only been on finding those people, you know, to bring them into our system, but then keeping the good people that we've got. Uh, the other thing that's been really successful and I'm excited about, we just launched this year uh, a separate website just for recruiting. So you can access it on our main website. It'll take you right to it. And we put it up front and center on the, front, on the main page, you know, uh, careers at V. And the, the response has been incredible. Um, Tens of thousands of applications. Not all of them are good. <laughs> so we, we created this animal now that we we got to figure out how to manage it. But it's been astounding. So, you know, just one one little. We I think we touched a nerve there, and we got to figure out how to make it work for us now. <laughs> but, well, another gentleman named Mullins in the audience wants to talk to you about his yeah. product. Uh, <laughs> Zykus is a, is a good front end that you might want to look at. We'll, we'll, um, fantastic. I think we covered kind of an interesting array of topics here. I want to open it up in the last few minutes to any questions. I mean, we have just incredible thought leaders here. Are there any general questions about development, workforce, or, or what we all do up here that any of you might have? 